He said, my name is Jerome Krauss. I'm from uh, Alaska Airlines. And I'm here to talk about so how we predict capacity in some external systems. Uh, just as a brief introduction to Alaska Airlines and AlaskaAero.com, um, a lot of you, if you live on the East Coast, might not know about us, um, but we're 85 years old and we are now the fifth largest airline in the U.S. Um, we pride ourselves on uh, a number of firsts. Uh, we were the first North American airline to sell tickets online. Um, we were the first in the world to allow people to check in and print boarding passes online. Um, we have award-winning customer service, a loyal, great loyalty program, and award-winning website, alaskair.com, which is our primary e-commerce website uh, where we sell uh, airline tickets for Alaska. Um, for a little context, uh, the website averages over 2.4 million page views per day with peaks over 4 million. Um, there's a lot of variation uh, because of sales mostly. Now, you would want to ask why we use a third party for shopping. Um, this has to do with how the airline industry works. We use a company called ITA uh, for our shopping services. The way the airline industry works, uh, Alaska Airlines and all of the other airlines file fares and pricing with a company called ATPCO, which is a clearinghouse for all the airlines. Alaska Airlines uses a separate company called Sabre to book tickets and to track inventory. ITA combines both of those services. They download data from ATPCO and combine that with inventory from Sabre to provide availability and pricing back to us so that we can display that to our customers. One of the reasons all of the airlines use third parties is that we partner with each other and we also need our partners' fares and availability. So this gives us the ability to do that. This is a simple data flow of how uh, a shopping request goes through our system. So we start with the browser clients, both mobile and desktop. Alaskair.com lives on two on-prem data centers, both in Washington State. It's a Windows IIS website. We created a shopping API in the Azure Cloud that takes those shopping requests from the browsers through AS.com. And then we connect to our vendor ITA in the Google Cloud. And the relationship I'm going to be talking about now is the Alaska API talking to the ITA uh, vendor and their capacity and how that affects us. Uh, so the relationship from alaskair.com to, uh, well, let's talk about the shopping API. It lives in the Azure cloud. It's in service fabric. It receives requests from alaskair.com. And then it orchestrates requests to the vendor ITA. In most circumstances, a single request to the shopping API will result in multiple requests to ITA. Then it, course, it uh, handles the responses, stitches those responses back together, and sends them back to Alaska.com, where we then re display the res uh, shopping response back to our clients. ITA um, takes three basic request types, depending on the type of search. And this is important to note because it has an effect on how uh, we use up the capacity at ITA. The three different types are a fair search, a low fair search, and a schedule search. The fair search is the most simple, and it's where we know the actual flight and the day, and we can just request bring me back the availability and the pricing on that flight. It's very fast. That's the only thing it's doing. 
The low pair search is the most complicated one. It's where we take in an origin and destination and a date, and we're searching all of the flights on that date. Uh, possibly one way, possibly round trip. So that one actually does a lot more work. A schedule search is kind of a hybrid where we know the flights, but we stitch the outbound and the return together. So it does a little bit more work than the fare search, but not as much as the low fare search. Now, we are contractually um, have a limit in the amount of utilization we can use at ITA. So we have to know what that relationship is and how we are using it. So what we've discovered is that the utilization at ITA is controlled by the request rate, how fast we're sending requests there, and the duration, how long it takes for those requests to be satisfied. And the different request types have different rates and durations. So we have to consider all three of them simultaneously when we're talking about capacity. So here's a chart um, for February 4th. These are the request rates for the three different types of searches. The dark blue line with the huge spike at midnight is fair search. Uh, the green line is the low fare search. And the purple line is a schedule search. So we can see under normal conditions, we normally do many more low fare searches than the others. That big spike in the middle is actually a bot. Um, that is a company called Infair that screen scrapes our sites for our fares, and we allow this to happen. Uh, we're working on getting them an API so that they can hit that instead of going through our website, but right now this is the current situation. Um, one anecdotal uh, comment I'd like to make about the uh, value of watching this data. Back in, after Cyber Monday of 2017, we started watching this data more closely. And we noticed over the next couple of months that the request rates started to rise at an unusual rate. And eventually we discovered that half of that traffic, half of that load was bots not normal, not our customers. So we, in short order, uh, put in some bot blocking, put in a bot blocking service, and we got half our capacity back. So it, if you're talking about capacity, you really have to understand you know, where that traffic is coming from. So the flip side of the request rate is how long do those queries take to be satisfied. Uh, and you can see, because the low fare search does a lot more work than the other two, it takes a lot longer to complete, uh, usually averaging over a second, whereas the fare search and the schedule searches take less than two-tenths of a second. So this is, uh, ITA actually reports, we have a reporting portal, we can go, we can download this data and they'll give us the utilization that we used for that day, given the request rates we were sending in and the durations that uh, the queries were taking. And you can see here, we average meh, around 100. Uh, the utilization is reported in what they call executable units, EUs. Um, we have a limit of 650 EUs. Now, when we first started with ITA, this EU limit was a hard and fast limit. If we went over that, they would simply return us an error. And this happened to us in um, Cyber Monday, I think it was 2015. We started getting in a lot of unexpected errors. And when we dove into it, we went over that limit because we were having such a successful Cyber Monday sale, it was actually hurting us. Today, thanks to the Google Cloud, uh, ITA has something called burst technology that they, if we go over our limit, the 650 is what's guaranteed to us. But if we go over the limit now, 
if there is available capacity in the system, they'll let us use it. So it's not quite as uh, severe a penalty for going over that limit. So when we first started to look at this, and what we wanted, because of Cyber Monday mostly, we wanted to predict where we are year over year, month over month, quarter over quarter, uh, where, how close are we coming to that limit? And the first thing we did was we tried to look at utilization versus request rate. And after a while, we realized that's not really giving us the best results. So we started to throw in the duration. And we started to get much better results. And we realized that there's a linear relationship between utilization and the request rate times the duration. And for ease of talking about it, I just call that the load factor. Um, and this linear relationship can be modeled mathematically using regression. And then you can use that model to predict what the utilization is going to be based on expected request rates and durations. So, you know, for the past couple years, we've been uh, doing these regression analyses. Uh, and where the actual utilization, uh, we download the data and we come up with a model based on the utilization and the load factor, where the total load factor is the summation of the request rate and duration for each of the three query types. What that looks like, one caveat here, uh, I used um, Microsoft Excel to do this linear regression anal analysis. I'm not a mathematician, so I'll leave the underlying math to them. Uh, what I can tell from this analysis uh, is this is a very strong linear relationship. Um, the R square factor of 0.85 means that the variance in utilization can be predicted 85% of the time based on the, the load factor. Uh, so this is a very strong relationship. The model ends up being, simply put, the equation for a straight line. Um, so down here we have y, which is the utilization, and it equals the total load factor coefficient times the load factor plus the y-intercept, and we throw into the model the standard error just to give ourselves a little buffer. So when we look at this model, and what we can do is apply some hypothetical load to it. And what you end up, well, here's a more um, a detailed explanation of what that model is. So you can see the utilization, and then x is the load factor, and you can see the load factor ends up being the fair search rate times its duration, the low fair, plus the low fair search rate times its duration, plus the schedule fair search rate times its duration. So we plot that on some hypothetical load factors. You get this blue line. So you have load factors along the bottom, expected utilization, and here you can see we would exceed, expect to exceed our 650 uh, executable units at about 29,000 for the load factor. So the next thing we wanted to do is validate this model. How well does it match reality? So what I did is I took data from the following day. So this is February 5th. And I did that because I knew we were going to have a very big sale. And I wanted to test the extremes of this model. So you can see at 8 AM Pacific time, we dropped 4 million emails all at once. And a lot of people clicked on it. <laughs> and within a half an hour, we went from a load factor of around 5,000 up to 25,000. So it quintupled very quickly. 
And that's the kind of load we need to predict because we do these types of sales all the time. There's Cyber Monday, uh, and those are the types of things that we need to, to catch and make sure that we don't exceed our limits. So this is the actual data from that day. What I did is I then took the load data and pumped it through the predictive model. And I wanted to see how well that would predict, how close that prediction came to the actual utilization. And that's the green line. So you can see it's very tightly matched to the actual utilization. It's slightly higher, but that's okay because I want to be a little bit conservative. So now I have a lot of confidence that my model is going to give me accurate results. So what do we do with this? We had uh, a company initiative last year where we introduced a new fair class. And the result of that is, was going to be that for every shopping query our guests submit, we were going to submit to ITA three or four times the number of shopping requests. And we wanted to know beforehand, before we put this into production, what that was going to do. So we, we used a predictive model like this. Um, let's see if I can get this to come up. make this a little bigger. If I can see this. Okay. So this is a spreadsheet that I put together um, incorporating the predictive model that we put together. And the blue line represents the, the hypothetical um, utilization for any given load. And what I did down the bottom is I created three uh, sliders for the request rate for the different types of uh, queries, searches. So we have fair search, low fair search, and schedule search. And then there's a chart over there where it applies the uh, model to those request rates. Now the one assumption I made here, uh, I didn't want to vary both the duration and the request rate, so I took the 95th percentile duration. So I'm, again, I'm trying to be a little bit conservative. So now what we can do is we can actually start to predict what our utilization is going to be by increasing these sliders. So if I know that I'm going to increase fair searches, I can drag this over and I can see what effect that's going to have. And because fair searches don't take very long, there's not a huge effect. So I can triple, quadruple this and there's not much effect on the utilization. But if I take low fair search, which you know takes 10 times as long, if I drag that over there, I can see, oh, there's a huge impact. And now if I throw in a little bit of these, I'm going to exceed my limit. And the great thing about this is I can see what's going to happen by varying one of them or all of them, but I'm not losing sight of the others. I'm considering all of them all at the same time. And this was very powerful for us because we were able to verify that given the changes we were making to code, uh, we were not going to actually exceed our EUs at ITA. And we had a lot of confidence to going forward with that project. Okay. How do we get back?
see. Yeah, I don't know how to get this back. You got it. You got it. This is my first time. <laughs> so what's next for us is right now, the data we get from the third party ITA, we have to go download it. Uh, that's not very good. What we want to set up is a live data feed and then pump that into machine learning. So we have a constant answer. We don't have to manually do this. Um, and we also want to adapt this type of analysis to other metrics, um, particularly with Windows IIS, how it queues and throws back server too busy. We can um, model that the same way, and then we can properly size our on-prem services and, and web farms. So that's it. Anybody has any questions? Hello. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you for sharing. Um, so you're not a mathematician. You mentioned that. How did you find it to find material on what to use? Right? Like, did you like? Did you just know logistic re uh, linear regression was a thing, and you were like, ah, this is probably linear? Or was there a statistician or a mathematician in the company who? No, that was uh, a lot of trial and error. Um, and a little bit of research on my part. Um, it was a lot of studying the data and looking at how it moves with, um, in response to other changing data points. Um, and just recognizing that that pattern, linear regression, might be a good fit. Thanks for coming and giving the talk. Um, it kind of seems like you're essentially reverse engineering the magic that ITA is doing. Is that kind of a fair characterization? Is that it not be, something yeah. you could have just asked them? Um, and I know some vendors are not very transparent, so maybe you couldn't. Yeah. They definitely agreed um, that I essentially reversed engineered how they come up with their utilization. But for us to actually come up with a, a predictive model, we would have had to do that on our own. Okay. Um. Hi. Uh, you do what I do for a living, so that's exciting to me. Um, so I had a couple of questions. Uh, looking at your utilization graph before and sort of what your max utilization was over a period of time versus where you could burst to, uh, the ratio between those graphs is incredibly high, at least for the way that I run my systems. Uh, and, you know, I understand you want to keep four sales days, you know, email blasts, these kind of things. But why the decision to keep that much capacity year round rather than just, you know, elastically build capacity for those days? Is it because you don't have the modeling data to work out how much to build? You mean the, the 650 utilization limit? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, that's a contractual thing. Right. That's not a, a practical thing. So. That's why that limit exists. Okay. And that might actually change in the near future. Oh, great. So. Uh, I would love to talk to you about uh, next steps and some pointers on what I usually do next in your scenario. Hi. Funnily enough, uh, I used to be an ITA essary. Uh, so <laughs> it's interesting seeing how other people use the system I used to run. Um, so yeah, it was really cool hearing about kind of the thing with the utilization uh, units, because each one of those used to be a server in an ITA data center. Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of the color Thank I wanted you, to add. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so my question was, I think you mentioned initially that um, you guys will use this model to basically test if your new code will actually change, uh, you know, whether you're going to go over the utilization. So how do you correlate your code changes to, to this model? It had to do with 
how many queries we were sending to ITA. And we knew that for a given customer query, because of what they selected um, in their choices, that the code would first issue a query, and then this was our saver fare initiative, it's a, a new fare class. And the way the code would have to work, we would send off one query to ITA. If that response contained saver fares, we would have to make two or three more queries for each one of those. So we didn't have an exact handle because it kind of depended on how our pricing department issued those fares, what, what markets they added those fares to, but we had a pretty good guess. Very interesting. So my question is, how much or how good was the forecasting information about when a certain fare would actually be searched or a particular search would actually happen? Looks like you had certain days, certain holidays that traffic grew wildly or there was a campaign or some type of event that caused traffic. How well was the forecasting for that particular event for you guys? Uh, that happens, it's pretty good. Um, what day to day, the traffic is very predictable. When we have sales, we know uh, what markets we know are gonna be, be sold. Uh, we drive people t in an email to a particular landing page, and it usually ends up doing a calendar shop, and we know in the code how many queries are gonna be issued when we do one of those. So it's fairly predictable. All right, let's give Jerome another round of applause for a great first talk. <laughs>